A key part of the Sustainable Development Goals is research, creativity and entrepreneurship, which are going to be the transferable skills for the future. Things don't just happen the way that they do in books. You've got to persevere and it will then work. Intergenerational learning is a key attribute because if we don't value what's already been, we're not going to value what's going to come. But if we constantly, as adults, always jump in and give the answers or tell children what to do, we don't actually develop divergent creative thinkers. My name's Diane, I'm Diane Boyd. I'm a senior lecturer at uh, Liverpool John Moores University. And um, my research and my PhD was about early childhood education sustainability. Um, now that might sound really scary, but it's actually not. It's, um, it's, it's what everybody does in practice. If they're doing good quality practice, they are doing that anyway. Um, sustainability has got sort of like three pillars. It's got the environmental sustainability, which tends to be what everybody knows about. If you say what is sustainability, people will say, is that environmental, climate change, um, saving the trees, uh, and that sort of um, aspect of sustainability. And what is tended to not be discussed um, is economic sustainability and social, cultural or socio-political sustainability. But both of those pillars are um, still deeply embedded into the foundations of early childhood. Um, if you look at all of the pioneers of early childhood, like Maria Montessori, Frederick Frabel, Rudolf Steiner, they've all come from a social justice um, and empowerment perspective of giving children and women rights and voices. Um, and therefore, that those two parts of sustainability mustn't be neglected. And... You can't really do one pillar without doing all three. So you can't do environmental without recognising that it will have an, in, in, um, an economic impact as well. I.e. that um, if you buy um, reusable, if you buy nappies from, uh, reusable nappies from um, a local business, you're helping the community economically because you're buying local, but you're also helping environmental because you are, buying something that is not going to go into landfill and also social culturally it's about sort of um, recognizing that um, everybody has got a, a voice everybody has got a right to their opinion but also um, highlighting that um, different cultures might have different practices as well and to not discriminate one over the other to say this is more that's important fascinating yeah, that, that, that's fascinating because um, I've got um, friends who have disabilities, which means that they can't use um, sort of the paper straws or different things that have been suggested to sort of get rid of plastic straws in terms of accessibility. And thinking about um, I suppose the barriers to, to these simple fixes to, to lots of different things and the idea that I suppose that there, there could be a framework for, access, you know, sort of assessing those barriers and and, and putting together solutions is is really exciting. Well, sort of like in, in 2015, 193 countries all signed a treaty in Paris. It's called the Paris Treaty 2030, where they basically set um, sort of targets for supposedly saving the planet by 2030. Um, and obviously a lot of them are sort of very much business minded, sort of like to do with in the um, energy or um, pollution or consumption. But um, a key part of that treaty was the development of the Sustainable Development Goals. And there are 17 of them. And again, the same as with the three pillars of sustainability, you can't look at one pillar in isolation and you can't look at one goal in isolation. They're all interconnected and um, critical to trying to make um, a difference um, to save the planet from where it's going and also for transformative education. Um, Sustainable Development Goal 4 is about education and it's about quality education. Um, and it sort of like highlights that the importance of education um, and that without an education, people are, will be kept in poverty or kept in um, sort of in isolation and that education is supposed to give people a voice and therefore um, education is not about being submissive or just listening, which you could argue that the early years foundation stage 
doesn't actually advocate because if you look at the targets for literacy and communication language, it talks about children sitting appropriately and listening and making appropriate responses. And I would have much preferred to have seen um, children being offered opportunities to voice what they want to do, to make decisions, to, um, to um, campaign, make campaigns, um, to do things that are actually um, real in a, in a real world for them. And, you know, it's not an abstract world. Um, children are well aware if there's a lot of traffic outside their school or if they're outside their nursery or if shops are closing on the main street, it's about having a conversation about why they think that's happening and what could we do to change things. Um, and then children then, and the, what, the reason why early childhood is so good is that a lot of these children then go home and start spreading this conversation at home with their parents. So early years children are very influential because the ripple effect is is quite sort of strong they then start to find that they then start to um, change the opinions and the attitudes of parents because the parents stop and go oh can't do that because or they might be doing something and the child goes stop you know you can't do that because you've got to save the polar bears and things like that so when i was a kid like it, it was like public health stuff was always directed at kids so like small clusters was a was a, a charity that was set up and it was basically about turning kids into anti-smoking campaigners who would go home and harass their parents and they're giving up smoking cigarettes. And it's about sort of, you know, a, a campaign. You might think, how on earth could an early years child do a campaign? But if you just look at literacy and numeracy within the early years foundation stage, it's asking children to be articulate, to be able to form opinions, to, to be able to write something, um, to be able to recognise numbers. So... Doing graphs or audits of how many sort of um, how many cars go past their um, school, how noisy it is, all those sort of things. Children are capable of doing that, and because of the fact that it's set in the real world, it's not an abstract activity, a task that you know a teacher has decided to plan. But um, it it has relevance and meaning, um, and therefore it makes sense. Um, and, you know, that's what Piaget talked about in terms of children making sense of something. Um, it makes sense to them to sort of like say, it means something to me. And therefore, I mean, like I, I did um, some uh, beach work with a colleague. And um, afterwards, about five months afterwards, I went back to the setting to talk to the children um, to see what they'd remembered from the beach campaign, uh, beach kindy that we'd done. And the children were drawing on big, uh, big pieces of paper, lots of bins. And I sort of like said, what are you drawing? What is it you, you're creating here? And they said, said um, there wasn't enough bins on the beach and adults don't care because there was so much rubbish on the beach. And they said, we really need more bins. And I suggested to the practitioner, you know, why don't we, why don't you do a beach bin campaign and get the local community involved so that um, you know, more bins are sponsored, et cetera, et cetera. And the practitioner was like, well, I can't do that because I've got literacy and numeracy to do. And I thought, well, isn't that what a beach campaign would be, being doing literacy and numeracy? So it's, it's trying to change your mindset to seeing that things that happen in the real world have got a relevance with the early years foundation stage. They're not detached. Um, you know, it's how you, how you apply the language of the early is foundation stage to the practice that you do. Um, so it makes sense to children and it's coming from them because we all know that if we're doing something that we want to do that interests us, then we put 100% commitment into it. Um, but if it's something that is being imposed on us, we're less likely to be the same as argument. responsive and yeah. so, it's the same, and that's the same for children. About, um, the arts and, you know, using theatre and music education and sport to, to teach children maths, English, science, you know, physics. Like, I was rubbish at maths at school. I was really good at physics. And I never understood how or, you know, really that there was even any intersect between those two things logically until the teacher explained that really physics is just maths for the story you know it's it's just that ability to conceptualize it and once I started thinking about oh well how can I think about maths as pictures and sort of picture that same as you might like a house or it's it rather than just a equals you know 
B, C or whatever, then it became much easier actually to understand that subject matter. I mean, another very good example of that is sort of um, place-based learning. So that covers um, environmental, social, political, social, cultural, and um, economic. Um, and an example I tend to use that really brings that together is that a lot of the time I see where I am, um, little groups of children from nurseries going along the high street in a little row um, with sort of like the leads to keep them all in the line and everything. And the practitioners are, are either at the front and the back and they're talking and the children are just walking. You'll go past on the high street um, shops that have been closed down or it might be that there's a homeless person in a doorway or you can see different types of shops so like a greengrocers, a butchers, a hairdressers, a, a cobblers and it's it's all those missed opportunities as you're walking down the high street to make links to sustainability so economically you could be saying every day that a small group of children go down the high street to the greengrocers and they buy different species of, of apple. So, you know, depending on the season, so a pink lady or a golden delicious or a gala apple. And that you take that back to the setting and, and you try all of those different ones out to see which one you like the taste of best. How does it taste different? What does it look like? What's the similarities? What's the differences? But by going into the greengrocers, you actually start a social relationship with the greengrocers so that you go in there and it's, hi, Bertie, hi, hi Billy, etc. The children all respond and they are developing a relationship with the people in their community. Maria Montessori um, wrote that adults pass by unseeing. And basically, we as adults, we just walk along the road and we don't notice things. Whereas children, if they're given the opportunity to walk slowly to notice things. There is opportunities for so many conversations and so many provocations for learning that are just missed all of the time because we don't stop. My favourite Kathy Klein song is the one about looking at the world through the eyes of a child. Um, it, it, and there's so much in there that you've said that's really, really exciting. And for me, as someone who does not work in early years, or um, have to plan um, sessions for, for young learners um, and, and, and who is a, a farmer in a, in, a, in, a, in a tiny little farm in a local community with a community allotment and all of that stuff. This all sounds absolutely incredible. But I can imagine that there's a proportion of our audience listening who are terrified about the sheer size of, of the stuff that you're talking about because they're being sort of, the pillars and then all those goals and those different development like strands and strategies it sounds great to be able to address all of those but when you start to think about how interconnected all of that is it becomes a huge web of stuff to cover so where can people start with building this stuff in because they have to understand it this. There are provocations that are taking place all around and children see those provocations um, and it might just be that sort of they come in to school um, or to the nursery and they've said something they've seen or they've heard it could have been on the news it could have been on social media or it could have just been something that they've seen in their local um, village or town or wherever and that it's a starting point. Children because of where they're surrounded sometimes in situations where in their home environment they have one view that is told to them. Research has shown that children have got racist and sectarian views by the age of three and therefore it puts a huge emphasis on the importance of early childhood education to be able to develop empathy, to develop um, a recognition of others and othering so that you have that um that kindness element um but it's hard but that's social cultural sustainability it's about social justice it's about equity inclusion about everybody having a voice and the voice as i said isn't just a human voice it's got to be an environmental voice as well so how can practitioners build more of that sort of project-based learning into their practice um again i think there's probably a portion of people listening to the, the podcast who have a plan where it's a this is 
the hour that we deliver this lesson or this is the time we spend looking at this thing and there might be 20 children that all have how do they adapt that um i have been writing for nursery world every month um uh, a diff a put a, a column about each of the sustainable development goals um about trying to um, recognize with practitioners that it's not something that's scary it is something that is actually quite easy to do if you are given um, a few little sort of like guidelines or provocations to follow. And then with cash, um, I am now developing a resource which is taking that further, where it sort of like really sort of like pushes and prompts um, ideas about what you could do in practice. So, for instance, um, I've just been writing and looking at Sustainable Devel Development Goal 10, which is... Um, reduced inequalities, but when you actually look at it, it's talking about migration, it's talking about um, inclusion, social, cultural, but it's about migration of people um, because obviously the sustainable development goals are also written by humans and therefore they would have had the human hat on. And a key part of the sustainable development goals is research, creativity and entrepreneurialship, which are going to be the transferable skills for the future. Well, you can start doing that in early childhood. You start by researching. Children have got iPads. They are very, very savvy with technology. It's the adults who probably aren't. Um, and the children can start to develop um, their own little podcast or they can make their own little newsletter or as a group they do it. Um, and you follow the interests of the children. And it might be that you end up going on a visit to see somebody or you invite somebody in or that you make a book that is for refugee children so that they feel comfortable. It really comes from wherever the children are. And, uh, and I can't stress this enough. I know a lot of practitioners would say, but I need to know what I'm going to do. And I think if you say that I'm having a starting point and you've got these, these textbooks that are specifically written for early childhood, um, and that you know that there is key terminology that you want to address, as long as you've got your starting point, which is the language, and you've got some key text stories that you want to sort of share, um, then that is your starting point. And you then see where the children take you. Taking that even further, that's, I suppose, changing those ideas around um, when we need to use the car and things like that. So um, again, like looking at things like weather, um, and changing the way that we feel about going out when it's raining or, you know, going outside. Um, we know that being outside for 15 minutes a day is really, really, really good for our well-being. Um, and it, it, it seems really simple. Um, but we hide from weather as grown ups. We become very attached to comfort. Um, so actually not getting wet or not going out is enough to take the car to the shop. But we will be better off jumping on our bike or going for a walk because it's not just about the sustainability and the the, the pollution and but actually the, the the people benefits you know the ben benefits to our well-being which makes us have a sustainable life because you're not going to get burnt out. Well, if you are spending time outside, if you're spending time with people who make you happy, then that's going to have an impact on you too. Um, so again, yes, it's, the, you know, that's why they're all connected, um, because then there's life, there's, there's sustainable development goal 12 um, and 13, 14 is about below water, 15 is about life on land. So again, they're connected, you, you know, sort of just that feeling, you know, of lying on the grass underneath the tree and just looking up at the tree and staring at the tree and actually feeling connected to that tree, just slowing yourself down. We don't let children do that. Everything is about, could you come and do this? And then when you finish that, I want you to go over there. Or if you finish that, you've got five minutes, you can go outside, but then you're gonna to have to come in and do this. It's about slowing everything down as well to becoming mindful of the environment that we live in and, and being um, emotionally attached to it. Because only when you're emotionally attached to something do you care for it? And therefore, it's that developing that ecological sense of self that you actually are connected and therefore it matters to you. So sort of thing. And, and the, you don't get that if you're... But also, one of the things I found last year when it was when we was in lockdown, you know, 
just spending time watching a tree develop over the course of a year, you know, sort of, it starts off in the winter with no leaves on it. And then you just start to notice the, the buds coming up and, you know, the blossoms and then the, the, the birds arrive. And it's about that slowing down and, and recognising what's in your environment. If you borrow a little bit of pedagogy from sort of those different practitioners and those different sort of schools of thought like Montessori and um, Reggio and, and all of that different stuff that, that exists, that you could really um, cover the EYFS and um, sort of by structuring it around these 18 different goals. I am linking every single point to either Development Matters 2020 or the Early Years Foundation Stage 21 so that, um, and it could be either an early learning goal or it could just be one of the points of the specific area or the prime area. But it's about sort of like recognising that, for instance, if you were doing sustainable cities and towns, which is SDG 12, um, that by getting children to sort of like use, you could have use Google Earth, start to notice what's in your town, going for a walk around your area and looking at the different um, properties, the different houses. Do they have chimneys, not have chimneys? So you're starting for children to be observant. Then you go back and you might do a bit more research. Then you might have conversations. These are all touching on communication language, literacy, because you're then going and doing the information, expressive arts and design, because then if you then make your town using recycled materials, you are creating something using different multimedia um, resources. So yes, it's, you know, by following this, you will be covering all aspects of the early years foundation stage, British fundamental values and developmental matters. So yes, um, the connections are all there. You just have to look for them um, and not feel that you have to be regimented into doing things to do with literacy. This is things like phonics, because if children were writing their own um, poster or designing their own poster and they're phonetically spelling out the words to go on their poster, Again, it has a real life context for them rather than doing a phonic worksheet, which they don't want to do. So you, you make it easier for them because it makes sense to them and that they want to engage in it. And it's that thing, isn't it? So why do we have to do this? Well, just because we do rather than this is great. I want to do it. And you can see the benefit really, can't you? It's that. Yeah. And you create it. I mean, it could be that you get them to do sort of... Um, on an iPad, um, you record a little little conversation with the children talking together about why it's important that we have um, trees in our garden or we have wild grass so that the bees are protected and there's pollinators um, and that they make a little podcast themselves and that it goes on the school website or it goes on the nursery website so that A, they can see that they're being listened to and valued, but the parents will also then respond to that and they will then make changes at home. So you're doing that ripple effect again. So, yeah, it's it's um, it's easy when you know how. And hopefully this resource that we're developing will help everybody to be able to um, understand the sustainable development goals um, and recognize the uniqueness of, of it in its place in the world, because there is not one single early years curriculum anywhere in the world that has got the sustainable development goals embedded into it um, and therefore this is a really great opportunity for um, English practitioners to pick up the mantle of sustainability and and run with it so that's, no, that, that's amazing and um, if anyone does want to make a podcast with their um, early years class or their, 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 their school age class around all of these interesting things and there is an episode of the podcast a few episodes back if you have a look in the feed um called how we make our podcast because when we first launched the podcast it was a completely doesn't cost any money is very much a test to see if anyone is interested in this um affair so there's there's some really nice tips in there around how that happened um but if you do do that, please share it with us because we would love to share it with our audience as well so that other practitioners can hear what you've done with your earlier working. And I think if practitioners see other people doing it, they then start to realise that they can do it too or that they're doing it already, but they didn't know they were doing sustainability. 
you know, that um, uh, social, cultural sustainability, it could be that you're doing something where you're bringing um, parents and carers and grandparents into your setting to sort of like sit and share stories about what the world used to be like years ago in, in their time. But that's social, cultural sustainability because intergenerational learning is a key attribute because if we don't value what's already been, we're not going to value what's going to come. It's about recognizing that everybody has got a place and that we can learn from each other and that there are skills that are vital that we take forward. Um, and one of the projects I did was um, a legacy cafe, which I have put the link into the resource where it was um, in Everton uh, Children and Family Centre in Liverpool where we had the local elders came in and were teaching the parents and the children those skills that we're not doing anymore. I do sew a button on when a button comes off. Um, majority of the time we were finding out that if, parent, if a child lost the button of their school shirt, they threw the whole school shirt away rather than sewing a button on. And you'd think, why couldn't schools or certain nurseries have a little pot of white buttons? And if a child has lost a button and it's come off during the day that you sort of like give up, but the parent can just take a new button out of the pot and they sew it on at home. Either that or we teach children how to sew on a button. So we give them that supervised to support so that actually that little pot of buttons in that setting is there and with a plastic needle, because a lot of, you know, cardigans are actually woolen still knitted, you know, in put their button back on. But landfill is full of clothes. Landfill is, and it, it to make one t-shirt, one t-shirt uses 2,600 litres of water, one t-shirt. So if you add all of those sort of factors down to environmental, but then economic and social cultural, you have to think, because a lot of the parents said to us, well, they're cheap. You can go down to Asda and they're like £1.50, I can get a new one. But then you have to say, well, if they're £1.50, where are they being made? And who's being paid to make your really cheap shirt? And, you know, why don't we try to reduce this landfill, reduce the carbon footprint of all of this um, and waste of water? And then on top of that, not just the waste of water, you've got all the chemicals that are used, the bleaching of white shirts and white T-shirts, the school, you know, and it goes on and on and on. And um, so, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of um, schools and nurseries in Australia, for instance, have now got um, swap rails. So, you know, when your child has outgrown an aspect of the uniform, they're still pretty okay. And you just take them in, you put them on a hanger, and if anybody wants to take it, you just take it. It's not, you don't pay for it, it's just there because it stops it going into landfill. I've literally, like before we talked on my lunch break, um, went to the post office to take um, a bag of clothes to, to send off um, because there is a, a website service called Swapped now where you can send off your old clothes and sort of give you credits and then you go on to their online shop and you use your credits to buy other people's unwanted clothes. Um, and I think especially in those periods where like you've either lost weight or put weight on and you've got loads of clothes that don't fit you that you're, you're going to swap for other things, it's, it's dead easy, isn't it, to go, oh, well, I'll just have a look on the internet and see what I can buy, you know, to because I need new clothes, um, rather than thinking about what you've got already and how, if you're lucky enough now to have the skills to do it, I've got a sewing machine in the cupboard and I, I would never think to just take in a shirt, you know, or to dart something or I would, I would sell it or give it away or take it to a charity shop. If you look at the pioneers, Froebel, when he, with his um, occupations, he had and his gifts. Gift eight was the linear line, and it was the precursor to doing stitching. Maria Montessori, her practical life skills were that every child could sew a button on. So with my early childhood study students in their first year, I make sure all of them can sew a button on. When we talk about Froebel and his gifts and his occupations, they all then have to sew a button on. And, you know, I can remember saying to them, who knows what darning is? And nobody knew what darning was. They didn't know, you know, like it was, why on earth would I sew my sock? Or, and it's again, sort of like saying, but if you just keep throwing things away, where do you think they go? And I had this, um, this picture 
of about six, seven tons of clothes that were on a street in Sydney. And I said to the students, how long do you think it took for that amount of clothes to be donated into one charity shop in Sydney? And they were all talking away and sort of like coming up with, say, like two months or three months. And I said it was an hour. You know, and if you think of the fact that majority of the time, a lot of this stuff that's donated doesn't actually end up in the shop because it's, it's either needs mending or it's dirty or it's broken. So they're thrown. So, you know, we, it, we've got to try and change the mindset. And if you look at Rudolf Steiner, Steiner's pedagogy of early childhood was about sustainability. It was about regenerative farming and gardening so that you're putting back into the earth. So you have compost, you put it back into the earth. Or when something is broken, you mend it. Um, or you have the skills like weaving, sewing, woodwork. They are your transferable skills so that you can be sustainable. That is what Rudolf Steiner was all about. Cash Alumni, the fastest growing network of current and future professionals in care, health and education. You can join us for free at cashalumni.org.uk and get access to articles from subject specialists and experts, e-learning, do a discount and benefits scheme, and lots of support with career development and your future growth. I was being observed when I was teaching and the two children that were sitting on the computer turned it off whilst I was doing something else. And afterwards, when I, was got, when I got my feedback, um, she sort of said to me, you know, you had two children there who were doing absolutely nothing. They were sitting in front of a blank screen on the computer. And I said, well, I actually beg to differ. I said, they turned it off by pressing a button and then they were then discussing how do we get it back on again and an adult didn't intervene they were there trying to work it out themselves and I sort of said if we constantly as adults always jump in and give the answers or tell children what to do we don't actually develop divergent creative thinkers we we develop children who just say tell me what to do tell me what to do where do I go now and you want children to be challenged. You want them to make mistakes because if they don't make mistakes, they're not learning. And do, do you think part of that is becoming comfortable as practitioners with not being necessarily in charge of what's going on or they're not needing to be a resolution? Um, and I suppose being a bit more comfortable with there not being an answer. Yeah, I mean, like it could be... Um, fear because they don't know the answer and therefore they don't want to be sort of questioned but um, I always say that there's absolutely nothing wrong and I say this to the students if if I don't know the answer that this student asks me I say I don't know the answer but let's find out and I don't really see why that should be any different with a three and a four-year-old but if they ask you a question that you don't do the typical thing of oh ask your dad or your mum when you get home you think this is research, this is what entrepreneurship is, this is about innovation, these are all the words of the sustainable development goals. Well, you find out, let's find out together. And so you do the research together and you find the answer out and and it becomes a journey together and it's a, it's a line of inquiry and you use the words of things like line of inquiry. So children use that language and therefore, you know, you're not, you're not fobbing them off but you're learning alongside the children. And that's what Reggio Emilio is all about. It's about the fact that you don't call children and teachers, children and teachers. They're both co-researchers. There is that idea of collaboration and cooperation and that we're, we're on this journey together. Um, and I think that's the thing that we've got to try and um, change our mindsets to think. Yeah, and what you just said about that sort of core research I think um when you're talking about you know practitioners jumping in and telling children the answer and when they're exploring a situation or figuring something out um I think for me that's probably one of the things that looking back at my own childhood learning experiences um probably hindered me the most in that I know that I now have to practice myself quite a lot um, from doing that thing where you're sitting in a meeting and there's all of these important people who know loads of really good stuff and they're talking and you think, well, what about this? And then you go, oh, well, if, if, if that was a thing, one of these other people would have thought about that already. Um, and I think that comes from that, you know, people just contributing the answer rather than trying to figure out 
why that didn't make sense to you or sort of having a conversation and helping you to explore it because actually children will often come up with answers that no one else has thought of and it's a perfect answer and it, and it answers lots of questions that because that level of complication isn't there for them um, that they can sort of see through things that we sometimes struggle with. As I said, if you have this big piece of wallpaper and you pose a question in the middle and then you look for answers and you test the answers out. So that becomes science and technology or STEM. You, you go through all of this process and you then at the end, if it still doesn't work, it doesn't really matter because you've gone through an investigation. You've gone through a hypothesis and you've, you've gone through estimates. And so as long as you're using that language with children, it's, it's, um, developing their their STEM capabilities, their 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 future skills for the 21st century, which is what we have to be doing, because heaven knows what skills are going to be needed when children who are four are 24 in 20 years time. If you think of how how the world has changed in 20 years, you know, what's it going to be like in another 20? So we've got to prepare children and preparing children isn't by giving them the answers. It's about posing questions and problems that might be frightening because they don't know the answers but again you say well we're doing this together it's collaboration you know and sustainable development goal 17 is about recognizing the importance of partnerships and it's about recognizing that if we're all in something together hopefully we can find the answer together you know and work like that so it might be something as big as saving the planet or it might be how do I make this rocket fly that I've made? Okay, let's think about it. How do we sort of thing? So it's it's about posing the questions and letting and trying to find the answers together as a as a collective. I know that we mentioned that you work and find um some of the writing that you do around the different sustainable development goals in nursery world. Um and that you're working on something with cash. So obviously we will share that when it's available for people to be able to find that resource. Um, and we're also talking about you maybe doing some stuff with Cash Alumni so that the people listening can find you on the Cash Alumni website going forward. Is there anywhere else that you'd like to find you, of course, people to? There is a, a book that I wrote with two other colleagues called Understanding Sustainability across the, um, I've forgotten the name of the book, Understanding um, Sustainability across early years. And then it looks at the four different countries of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, so that is also another helpful resource that um, might help practitioners to understand what sustainability is um, within their own context. Um, joining organisations, obviously there's eco schools, but I tend to think eco schools is much more environmental rather than the three pillars. And I think it's very important that we always focus on the three pillars together. Um, and there's also OMEP, um, O-M-E-P, um, UK, which is about education for sustainability within early childhood. Or if anybody ever wants to ask me any questions that they can email me at johnmoores at d.j.boyd at ljmu.ac.uk and um, I'm happy to help anybody who might want to start on this sustainability journey. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely amazing to talk to you. And thanks to you at home. Don't forget, for more great content tailored towards those working in care, health and education, it's free to join our network and you gain access to some great articles, videos and resources to support your career and some information about career development as well as our members' discount and benefits scheme. And if you'd like to feature on a future episode of PodCash, please get in touch at alumni at cash.org.uk. Until next time, take care.